Sanity and the Metaphysics of Responsibility by Susan Wolfe. Susan Wolfe is a professor of philosophy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, her work is in ethics and in metaethics, particularly responsibility. Um, and she was actually one of our Shipka speakers in 2017. So the former Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies has a speakers fund that we bring in prominent philosophers um, to talk on various issues. And so Susan Wolf was one of those that we've had here at YSU. Now in the article, what Susan Wolf is asking is a very simple, and very straightforward question. And it's one that we see in morality all the time. And the question is, why are we responsible for anything at all? So what Wolf is concerned here is with the idea of responsibility for our actions in a world that seems to be determined. And so she's attempting to put together an argument for some sort of freedom so that we can be held responsible for our actions. Because if we note, if we can't be responsible for our actions, it's difficult for us to be held morally accountable for our actions, right? If I'm not responsible for what happens, then there's really little room for you to criticize my actions, right? If I could not but have done something, in other words, I was in no control of what I was doing, then you can't hold me morally responsible for that. So what Wolf says is, I suggest that the mundane recognition that sanity is a condition of responsibility has more to do with the murky and apparently metaphysical problems which, which surround the issue of responsibility than it first meets the eye. So in answering this question about responsibility, what Wolf is going to ultimately argue for is that there is this condition of sanity that we must have. So in other words, you must be sane in a very specific way in order to be held responsible for your actions. Now, there's nothing sort of unique about this, and this is why she says, I suggest that the mundane recognition, it's a sort of everyday sort of um, common idea, is something that's fundamental to responsibility and moral responsibility. And she's also going to tie this in with the determinism that I've mentioned. So this is one of the things that philosophers um, struggle with, especially ethicists, is that we seem to be determined in our actions, so how can we get away from this determinism or how can we answer sort of those who would question freedom and our freedom of action in order to hold us morally accountable? And so what she's going to attempt to do is give an answer to that sort of classic problem in ethics or in meta-ethics. So in doing this, she's going to look at three views. So these are the views of Frankfurt, Watson, and Taylor. And what you're going to notice in Wolf's approach is one that's very common to contemporary philosophers in that what they will often do is look at the leading view of one or more people, will look at what they think are the strengths of those views as well as the weaknesses, and then attempt to modify or revise them in a way that makes them um, more compelling. So the first part of her article is really both a presentation and a critique of these three views, where she says these are good, there's a good start here for philosophy, or philosophy of responsibility, but it needs something else. And this is where her conditions of sanity are going to come into play as sort of an amendment to the sort of core idea that all of these individuals actually share. So let's start with Harry Frankfurt's view. According to Harry Frankfurt, freedom of action is tied in with freedom of the will. So to act freely, we must also act with a free will. So an agent has freedom of action if their will or desires are up to that agent. And therefore, we can hold them responsible. So an agent has freedom of action if their will is free to desire what they want to desire, and can choose to do that, then they're responsible. An agent lacks freedom of action, of course, if the will or desires are not up to the agent, and therefore we can't hold the agent responsible. So for Frankfurt, freedom is tied to will, right? I can choose to, I can choose to do certain actions, and I can choose um, whether or not to do other actions, 
And all of that's going to depend on whether or not I'm free to choose that. So if I were, for example, to go into a store and steal a watch, right? So I go in the store, I steal a watch, and the question is, well, was I or am I responsible for that theft? Well, I'm responsible for that theft if my will or desire was within my control. So in other words, I could control myself. I could choose whether or not to actually, to actually steal the watch. Now, if, for example, I wasn't in control, so let's say I'm a kleptomaniac and I can't actually stop myself from stealing, then I can't be responsible because my desire or the will, I lack the willpower not to do that, right? There's something about me that doesn't allow me to do that. So for Frankfurt, in order to say that an agent has freedom of action or that they lack freedom of action, it's all going to depend on the nature of their will or their desires and whether they have control over those will or desire. So the freedom of action requires freedom of the will. But in addition to that, and the freedom to will what one wants to will. So in other words, not only do I have to control my desires or my will in that first instance, right, before I take an action, but I have to also be able to have the freedom to will what I want to will. In other words, I have to be able to determine what kind of person I want to be in essence, right? So if I have desires for a watch and I also have desires to take that watch, but I also should have what he's going to call a second order desire to be the type of person that doesn't steal things. So even though I might desire things on one level, right, there should be this sort of meta level which allows me to look at which things I desire to do and what I desire, what will, things I want to will, and I should be able to control those. So we think of it as these different stages. So he calls these second order desires. So the second order desires are the ones that inform my first order desires, right? What things do I want to desire? What sort of actions do I want to take? What kind of person do I want to be? And these are the second order desires about my first order desires, and those first order desires inform the actions that I actually take. So when I'm looking at someone's actions and trying to determine whether or not they're responsible, these actions are actually ultimately ordered by my second order desires, not my first order. So there are a number of desires I can have, right? There are a number of things that I can do, good or bad. And the question is whether I have control over those, whether I got to choose those first order desires. Now, as I mentioned, there's some desires we just don't have any control over, right? So if I'm a kleptomaniac or if I'm an alcoholic, right, there may be some things that I just can't control or that it's extremely difficult for me to control. And in that sense, I might have diminished responsibility for those things, right? So if I have a first order desire to steal, but I recognize that stealing is a bad thing. I don't want to be the type of person that steals. Then I've sort of reflected on my first order desires based on these second order desires. So I have desires about my desires. And this for Frankfurt is going to determine whether or not you're free, right? So we could all have first order desires. So we could just act on impulses, right? The desires that we have in the moment. And that would not, if that's the only thing I can do, if I can only act on the things that I immediately desire, then Frankfurt would say I'm not responsible for those actions. On the other hand, if I do have the ability to reflect on these first order desires, if I can say, yeah, that's not the thing I should want, that's not the thing I should do, that's not the thing I should will, then in, those, in that case, I am responsible because I could have changed those desires. Right? My second order desires are there to inform those first order desires, and therefore I chose to do it. And that's what it means to act freely for someone like Frankfurt. Now, Watson's view, again, has a very similar sort of feel to it, much in the way it follows along much in the way that from Frankfurt's view. Right? So only actions that can be governed by values or one's valuational system are free. So if something is free, then of course I can be responsible for it, right? So Watson is saying something very similar, although he's couching it in our value system. So only actions that are governed or can be governed by my value. So if it's possible for me to hold a value, for example, that stealing is wrong, right? And I have this system of values in which one ought not to take things from other people, one ought not to hurt people, 
and so forth and hurt them by taking their goods. And so all of those sorts of values are my valuational system. Then if those things, it's possible for those things to inform my actions, then those actions are considered free. And if they're free, then they're, then I'm responsible for them. So what Watson does is break down actions into two different types, right? First, he starts with mere desires. Actions can be just mere desires. They can also, or there can also be actions based on values. So mere desires are the things that I immediately want or act on without thought. These, are, these might be, in fact, things that have been given to me or that things I just have. So certain appetites may be viewed as mere desires. Conditioned responses. So in other words, there may be things that I have been sort of programmed over time to respond in a certain way or to desire in a certain way. These are things I don't have control over, right? So if I'm raised in a certain way, I'm raised with a set of beliefs, or if I have certain appetites, certain just mentally the way I'm sort of wired, these mere desires are things that I have no control over. And since I have no control over those things and they're not affected by my values, then these are just mere desires and I really can't be held responsible. These are not things that I'm free of. So appetites might be things like being a kleptomaniac, right? Those sorts of things, or if I have some sort of um, mental issue, right? That doesn't allow me to, that I have no control over, right? And those things might just say, well, then those desires that I have and the actions that follow from the desires are really aren't free. Values on the other hand, um, are things that I do or I can be held responsible for, right? So those things which um, judgments that objects of desire are good. So if I am able to, in fact, look at what it is I desire and the things that I'm, and based on my value or valuational system, I can judge that these objects are good and other objects are bad, then this would be, this would be one and an, an action that I would be responsible for that is free and therefore responsible. And if it's governed by my valuation system, so if I make a judgment that an object is good and that object falls within my valuation system, then I'm responsible or free in that case, in that action. But notice again, this is very similar to Frankfurt's view because on the one hand, Frankfurt of course says things that I don't have control over, desires and things that I don't have control over, that my second order um, desires don't control, I can't be held accountable for. But the things that they do, I can be. And the same thing with Watson, he says, look, there's some things that we desire, these mere desires that we have, these appetites or conditioned responses, things that were given to us that we have no control over, we can't reflect on, they, we just have them. We can't be held responsible for those. But those actions that are based on judgments, that a particular object is good, and the, the way in which I go about that action governed by my value or my system, my valuation system, then these are things that I am responsible for. These are free acts, right? Because they're not things that are just pushing me without sort of thought or reflection. Now, Charles Taylor, very quickly, um, doesn't give us a lot of detail about his view, or at least Wolf isn't giving us a lot of detail about, about Taylor's system, but she notes the following that according to Taylor, our wills must issue from selves that are subject to self-assessment and redefinition in terms of, vocab of a vocabulary of worth. So what Taylor is saying is very, again, very similar to what both Frankfurt said and Watson said, is that I have a self that acts. And the question is, is that self subject to a self-assessment or redefinition. In other words, can I look at my actions? Can I look at my desires? Can I look at the things that I do? And can I reflect on those things and determine whether or not they're actually good? And can I change them? So if I look at certain desires I have, whether it's for wealth or fame or knowledge or whatever it is, and can I assess my desires and how I behave and then change myself in light of those assessments, then on that account, if I can do that, then the actions that stem from me are free. And therefore, I can be held responsible for them. Right? And what, um, what Wolf is going to say is that this is what she calls the deep self-view of responsibility. And so Frankfurt, Watson, and Taylor 
share this sort of intuition that to be responsible for an action must be under the control of a deeper self. So it's not your immediate actions and it's not your immediate desires that tell us whether or not you're responsible. You took some action and therefore you're either responsible or not. What they're going to say is, no, there has to be something deeper than your immediate desire. In other words, you have to be responsible for your which desires you have. So the second order desires in the case of Frankfurt guiding the first order desires. In Taylor's case, it says, well, okay, there's mere desires, things that you might do, right, because of appetites or sort of conditioning, and you're not responsible for those. But if, in fact, you can reflect on your actions and you're aware of that based on your values, on the goals you're choosing, the things that you're viewing as good and the valuation system, then Taylor says, well, if you can reflect on those things, then those acts which you did reflect on or have the ability to reflect on, those are the ones you can be held responsible for. And then Taylor comes along and says, look, just being able to think about yourself, to take a self-assessment about yourself and what you do and how you're acting and to change yourself in light of that assessment, so that's that deeper self, right, that you can then choose and therefore you're free. So this view fits with our intuitions about those who are and are not in control of their actions, right? So I've already mentioned some of these I've talked about people who are kleptomaniacs and can't help but steal. We also think about things like children or animals. We don't hold them accountable for their actions. Why? Because they're not able to control that sort of deeper self, right? Whether we talk about in the Frankfurt sense of deeper self, Watson or Taylor, in any of these cases, most children, very young children especially, have no sort of self-awareness in that way, right? I can't look at the one-year-old or the two-year-old and maybe even the three-year-old or four-year-old and say, oh, they're able to actually think about the type of desires they ought to have. And in fact, that kind of complex thought really doesn't come into play until we're much, much older. All right? So if we look at moral development of individuals, most people develop in these various stages. As we get older, we can sort of reflect on what it is we value and why we value what we value and whether we still want to value those things. When you're asking those kind of questions, you're asking these sort of deep self kind of questions, right? That's your deeper self informing the actual feelings or intuitions that you have at the moment, or your desires, the feelings, desires that you have at the moment. And now, according to Wolf, this view in responds in at least one way to the fear of determinism. And so let me just start with what is determinism. So for those aren't who aren't familiar with it, Determinism is the view that everything we do is completely determined by a causal chain that extends backward beyond the time of our birth. Thus, we have no control over our behavior whatsoever. So if we think of determinism um, in the way of physics, where one event causes another, then it seems that you and I are actually the end result of a bunch of causal, of a bunch of causal chains that lead to us being here. Now that doesn't seem to be particularly problematic. Of course I'm caused by something else, right? My parents got together, they had me. Their parents got together, each of their sets of parents got together and had them, and then they got together and had me and so forth and so on, and I got together, you know, with my significant other and we had our kids, and so there you go. We've got this chain of causal events. But determinism goes deeper than that because determinism says, well, not only are our physical beings caused, our physical selves caused, but aren't the very sort of mechanisms that we use for thinking, right? The synapse firings in our brain, the conditions around us, don't those things all cause us to do certain things, have certain thoughts? So if you really think of it at the sort of, sort of microscopic level, everything that I'm thinking was caused by something that came before it, right? There was a synapse that fired before it. There was somebody who taught me something that then got ingrained in my brain and then caused me to think in the way I do. And if this is true, then it seems that everything I think, everything I do, every action I have is ultimately caused by something outside of myself. And what each of these views are attempting to do is show that there's something or that we have some ability to control those things that we will. In other words, it's not just this infinite set of causes and in fact, the causes that then affect the actual synapse firings in my brain that cause the ideas that I have and the wills that I have, that somehow I'm an active participant in determining what it is I desire, what it is I will, and therefore how I act. And if I can 
establish that, then we can establish both free will and I can establish responsibility and, and moral responsibility for my actions. All right, so the desires I have can be sort of grouped into two types, right? Those are determined by forces foreign to us, that is outside of us, and those are determined by the deep self. Now there is a question, and, and Wolf brings this up, and I'll sort of leave that sort of out there, not going to go into detail, but who determines this deep self? All right, well, Wolf, Wolf says it as we look at Frankfurt and Watson and Taylor, they're all implicitly buying into this deep self sort of argument, right? They each have a notion of kind of a deep self. And if the deep self can determine itself, it can reflect on itself or it can control which desires it has or what it wills, then that's great. We now have responsibility, and if we have responsibility, we can have morality. But there is a question of who determines the deep self. And if the deep self is determined, isn't that problematic? Well, Wolf sort of answers this, right? And I'm just going to quote her directly. We can reflect on what sorts of beings we are and on what sorts of marks we make on the world. We can change what we don't like about ourselves and keep what we do. Admittedly, we do not create ourselves from nothing, but as long as we can revise ourselves, they will suggest, it is hard to find reason to complain. So Frankfurt, Taylor, um, and Watson all have this view that even if we've come into the world, right, you can't start from nothing, right? We don't create ourselves. That's obvious. So I didn't choose to be born, right? That's the sort of, that's the sort of attitude here. I didn't choose to be born. I didn't create myself. But as long as it's possible for me to revise the self that I'm found, that I find myself, that's a weird way of putting it, as long as I can revise the self that I am, that it's not fixed, then we don't have reason to complain. In other words, we can sort of give, we can sort of give a nod to a non-deterministic sort of world. So part of us is determined because we didn't create ourselves, but it turns out we can revise ourselves. And that's the sort of view that those other three philosophers are pushing in the work, right? This is what Wolf is saying. These three have this idea, and if we can do this kind of revision, if we can look at our desires, if we can look at who we are, we can self-assess, we can reevaluate, we can change ourselves, then the fact that we can change ourselves means that we have some control. And as long as we have some control, we can have some responsibility. And that's where we get our free, both our freedom to act and the responsibility for those actions. So she's going to start with this, but she says that's not enough. What they've given us so far, each of those three views, is not enough to say that we're actually free and thus responsible. All right, so how is she going to do this? What is, what is it she's going to add to this view? This is where, as we said at the very beginning, the condition of sanity. All right, so her, her view is all of these things are good. They go, they go pretty close to what we need in order to get moral responsibility right? Freedom of, or freedom of action. Note that when I say moral responsibility and freedom of action, these two are intimately tied with each other, right? To say that I'm free to act and thus responsible implies that there's a, a deep connection between these. So what she's saying is they're all close, but they're missing something, right? And so what she's going to offer is a revision of the deep self view. In order to revise oneself, an agent must be sane, right? This is her fundamental idea that to revise myself, I just can't be, it just can't be me reflecting using any criteria. I have to have sanity as part of that, right? The, the revision of the deep self is I must be a sane individual. So we must be controlled or connected to the world in a certain way. This is what she means by sanity, right? And sanity is the minimally sufficient ability cognitively and normatively to recognize and appreciate the world for what it is. So to be sane is to recognize the world and our place in it, that we're controlled by the world and connected in the world in a certain way. So we're controlled by the world in the sense of physically we're controlled by the world, right? There are certain laws that govern the world. So to be a sane person is to recognize that certain laws of nature just apply. At least this would be the interpretation I would take of her work, right? So for, for sanity, it would think that, look, I know, well, I, I know gravity actually pulls us towards the earth. So even if I really desire it, I believe I can fly, when I go out of the second story window in my house, I'm going to fall to the ground. And if I don't think that's going to happen, 
then there's a problem because I don't recognize the world for what it is. In other words, that objects are pulled towards the ground. If I think that I can simply walk out of the window and float above or float outside my window, there's something wrong with me. Similarly, connected to the world in a certain way is to note that I'm connected with other individuals normatively. Right? There are certain things that people do and don't do. There are certain inter, um, relations between individuals. We can even look at our social structures, certain norms and how they work, that if I don't recognize that, again, there's something I'm missing. Right? I'm missing the fact that others out there, for example, don't go, out, go around randomly killing other people. And while it's a fact that I can do that, the same person might recognize that there are certain social norms that should be followed, if for no other reason because they allow us to live better together. Right? So this revision to the deep self means that sanity has to be an integral part of that deep self, that there's some condition. So the sane deep self view says that a deep self that lacks the resources or reasons for self-correction or improvement can, properly, can be properly viewed as not sane and thus not responsible. So if I don't have those two connections, right? if I don't recognize my connection to the world and that I'm controlled in some sense by the world, then you can't hold me accountable. So people who don't are, are sort of detached from reality say are people that we normally don't hold responsible for their actions or if they don't have the resources for viewing the world in any other way so the example given in the book for example the jojo example in which jojo is raised by jojo the first the dictator the sadistic dictator who raises his son to be also this sort of sadistic terrible person and so the question is whether jojo jr is able to actually look at the world in a way and self-correct. But if they've been raised in a way that that's just not possible, if they haven't been given the resources to view outside of themselves or the way in which they go, in other words, they view the world in a certain sort of perverted way in which these actions are totally acceptable and this is how one ought to behave or can behave towards other individuals and there's no need to guide your will in any other way, then there's a real question about their sanity, right? At a deep level, you might ask whether Jojo is in fact sane or whether they've been raised in a way that makes them incapable of the self-correction. So we can be metaphysically not responsible while being morally responsible, right? So there's a sense in which we can have metaphysically not responsible in the sense that we were caused to be the way we are while being morally responsible and it's also, the, it's also the case that we can be metaphysically not responsible and morally not responsible, right? And that's what the JoJo example sort of shows, as well as things like the question about Nazis and slaveholders. Now, I'm not going to go into sort of the discussion here whether or not those individuals are sane or not sane, whether we, we buy into Wolf's argument here. But there is, something, um, there is something compelling about the case, right? If I lack certain deep self um, resources, then it's kind of hard to hold me accountable, isn't it? I mean, it seems difficult to say that I could simply step outside of what it is I know and what's sort of been drilled into me and what my society may have drilled into me and then suddenly say, oh, yes, I should have self-corrected. I should have realized why this was wrong. There is a sense in which there's, a, there's some sort of deprivation of my will, of my person, that I'm not fully there. In other words, I don't recognize certain normative standards that I should have or that I'm just simply incapable of because those standards just aren't there. So the same deep self view um, says that when you lack these resources, you're not responsible. Self-creation, self-correction, and self-revision. So if we want to take sort of Wolf's view and summarize it here, we get something like the following. There are certain conditions of sanity that we must have in order to be responsible. So these include the ability to evaluate ourselves sensibly and accurately. Right? So I have to be able to reflect on my actions and recognize um, what it is I do, what it is I'm thinking, which actions I'm choosing to take. Two, I have to have the ability to transform myself insofar as our evaluations tell us to do so. So I have to be able to reflect on my actions or evaluate myself 
and then to use that information to transform myself. Now notice this is when we go back to sort of the easy examples of things like children or animals, right? Does, it, does an animal have the ability to evaluate itself sensibly and accurately? Can it look at its actions? Can the lion look at its actions of killing other animals to eat, whether it should or whether it should become a vegetarian, for example? Well, it clearly lacks the, eval the, the ability to evaluate itself and it can't just change its nature, right? It's programmed into the animal what it's doing. It's following its mere desires if we were to go back to one of the previous views, right? We could look at it that way. So if these conditions of sanity then inform our deep self, so assuming you have those conditions of sanity, the ability to evaluate and the ability to transform or revise based on those things, those things inform our deep self. Our deep self then informs our self Right? Our actual desires, our actual person, which then inform our actions. So to be free and to be truly free and thus responsible, we have to sort of, this chain has to apply. There have to be these conditions of sanity which inform our deep self. The deep self informs our self, which then informs our actions. And this is for Wolf the conditions of sanity which lead to our being free and responsible beings.